Warren Buffett once told the story of his closest friend from Columbia Business School. He said the guy was incredibly smart, incredibly hardworking, really strong ethics, great character, and they kind of were in a similar spot as they graduated. But the outcome of their lives was dramatically different based on a single decision. The friend of his went to the steel business and he said worked you know very hard and earned a modestly you know modestly good living um while warren went and started his first private partnership and then what would eventually become berkshire hathaway and he said this final quote which has always struck me or struck me then and stuck with me since which is what i learned was it's not as important how hard you row but what boat you are in and so in the video that I'm about to show you, uh, this was a presentation that um, I was given for a keynote, and they asked me to talk about what they called level seven entrepreneurship. So once you kind of, they have like levels one through six that they were talking about, level seven is kind of rising above the businesses and using your businesses as, or seeing your businesses almost as products that increase your you know, personal net worth, et cetera. I took that to mean, how do we assess and appraise opportunity itself? This is one of my one of my favorite presentations I've ever given, um, and I hope that you get value from it, Mosey Nation. For those of you guys who don't know me, by the way, my name is Oxford Mosey. I own Acquisition.com. Uh, it's a portfolio of companies that does about $85 million a year. I make these videos just because I think a lot of people are broke, and I don't want you to be one of them, and hopefully some of the lessons that I've learned along the way uh, can help you. So uh, buckle up and enjoy. How's everybody going? Awesome? Sweet. Uh, so I am a level seven entrepreneur, category five hurricane, uh, level 10 fire breather, top secret security clearance holder. Uh, it was kind of weird to uh, hear the context for the talk today because I don't really feel like a level seven entrepreneur. Um, just feel like somebody's taking a couple steps forward and one toe after the other. So let's rock and roll. Everybody good with that? Sweet. It's acquisition.com, that's our fancy logo. Awesome. You guys wanna hear something totally insane? Uh, oh, I can see it here, much better. Uh, I was able to take home more in a year uh, than the CEO of McDonald's, Ikea, Ford, Motorola, and Yahoo combined as a kid in his 20s. Which is equated to over 1.2 million per month in dividends for nearly half a decade. And I haven't talked about it publicly that much, mostly because I didn't really care to. We're at an interesting point, and Ryan asked me to, to bring this up, where we've exited two companies this year, sold our house, sold our car, and I'm kind of in a season right now of consolidation and kind of distilling down what I like to call artifacts. So just frameworks, that crystallize the learnings so that I can set forth for my next chapter with kind of a backpack full of lessons. And so I have way more frameworks than I will be able to share with you today. Um, that book is the first of 10 books uh, that I'm writing on it. That is really just expounding on one framework. Uh, but I'm gonna share with you four today uh, that hopefully you get some good stuff out of, all right? And no one was more surprised than me uh, to hear those numbers. So, What's interesting is that me expressing that fact creates envy in some people, anger in others, skepticism in most, and confusion in old people. <laughs> and hopefully inspires a select few, um, because you guys are who I'm making this for. So um, these are just a few level seven observations I added in quickly this morning, because uh, Ryan asked me to talk about a couple of these. Some things that I've learned. One, everyone wants you to do well, just not better than them. Except that no one actually wants you to be rich except for you. I really mean that. Because if you're not fighting for you, no one else is. Money only solves money problems, and then you are left with problems that money can't solve. You don't arrive, you just enter a new club as the smallest member. The guy who literally lives in the unit directly above me in my building uh, took home one billion this year in income. Not an exit, income. He owns outright, 100% owner, 3.8 billion a year in sales, 26% net margins. And last year, he took home 920 million. The year before that, he took home 850 million. Cool guy. <laughs> so, I'm just poor. 
And um, one of the last observations I'll say is that this last year, I would say we fully exited the, the org chart. And we're making pretty much the same money that I just showed you. And uh, it was wildly uh, boring and like almost depressing. And so I, I kind of have this thing that like, let's make active income cool again, because I think passive income is slightly overrated because we all have this desire, we seek freedom, but what I really think we want is options. Um, and we want engaging activities because we are, like imagine, because all of us buy back all of our time. And imagine you buy all of it back and you're making all the money and you do nothing. It's terrible. <laughs> um, and so I'm just sharing this with you because that was my goal for such a long time that when I kind of got there, it's, it's, not, it's not fun. Like all I want to do now is start something else because I've got a lot of summers left, right? <laughs> so might as well do something cool. All right, so who wants to hear about stuff that can shortcut your path to material success so that you can ponder the purpose of achieving it to begin with? And so I think that there's something to be said for intention behind how you create your business um, and people can feel why you're doing things. Total tangent, I uh, was talking to a buddy of mine who just sold his company for 200 million and he said, you know what's interesting is that when you talk to most people, he said 99% of people are plugged into the matrix. And what he meant by that is that they're operating from a place of lack and a place of desire to get other people to give them money, right? That's kind of where they operate from. He said, when you exit the matrix, it's very rare, but you'll see that when you make things just for the sake of making them, like art, then they, ha they take on a whole different form. And this book was kind of the first of the many things that I hope to create from that same space. Um, and so anyways, I hope you enjoy it if you do pick it up. And hopefully I'll prove to you some enough, enough value for 99 cents. So how I turned $1,036 into $85 million a year in portfolio revenue in five years using four frameworks. And that is December 20th, 2016. So your life can change pretty quickly. All right, so that was me when I started. I uh, didn't have enough money for rent, so I slept there. Scaled those locations from, it always still hits me. Um, mostly because I'm just grateful, you know, for where we're at now. Anyways, um, I'm sorry. Scaled these locations from zero to six um, in three years off cash flow, which was pretty cool. Um, then I did 18 months of doing gym turnarounds, which is kind of like gym rescue or like bar rescue, but gyms, but no gym owners want to get rescued, so I called it gym launch. Brilliant marketing right there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is actually the first ad I ever ran, which is actually me just doing a walkthrough of this, this gym in the hood. Hood. Um, and I did 191 signups in 19 days, just me selling one-on-one at 500 bucks each. Um, I would show you, but I don't think we have enough time. Um, but that ad, if you ever want to check it out, it's on my YouTube channel. It's got like 400,000 views. Um, it's 90 seconds. So anyways, from there we packaged the IP uh, for a better gym model, because I had six gyms and then I did all these turnarounds. Um, we scaled that to 2.4 million a month, which is a B2B business. Uh, then we started a supplement company, scaled that to 1.7 million a month. That's B2B to C and B2C. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that means business to business and business to consumer. Sorry, and business to business to consumer. Uh, and then after that, we founded a software company, which scaled to 1.6 million a month, which was B2B to C, uh, which we actually just sold two months ago. And uh, yeah, that was cool. Um, <laughs> and then we co-founded uh, a national photography chain, uh, which now, 14 months later, is doing 1.1 million a month. So, and now we have acquisition.com, so we take interest in 7, 8, and multi uh, e-learning and local chains, and we grow them to exit. So that's what we do. Which is cool for me, but what's in it for you? All right, so here's my goal for the presentation. To help you get you from where you are, using some of the lessons that I learned the hard way, and a few stories to make them stick, uh, to a level seven zillion entrepreneur. Cool? Which is an entrepreneur who contemplates the meaning of life because they have no need for money. Great. So, if you have achieved, if someone has achieved success, and I'm gonna use quotes here, faster, again quotes here, than you, then they simply have been better allocators of a single resource, and it's probably not the resource you think, all right? So I wanna base my presentation today on a single premise, which is time allocation is the only thing that matters. If you master time, you will master material success. I'm not saying you'll master happiness, I'm just saying you'll master material success, all right? 
And so don't worry, this is not a time management presentation. Um, this is a presentation on how to drag your time horizon by the balls into the present, all right? Way faster than everyone you desperately want to beat. I mean that, right? Like you can drag your time horizon to the present if you learn how to think differently, all right? So from the outside, what appears to be speed is not lots of activity. That is a fallacy that most entrepreneurs believe. All right, it is making the right strategic decisions and making fewer mistakes. So if you see where it says micro fast, macro slow, for the most part, when I look at entrepreneurs and I see what they're doing, that's what their life looks like. They go really fast and then they change directions. They go really fast and they change directions. But I can tell you my neighbor who's right above me, he's been doing the same thing for 40 years. And it's micro slow, macro fast, and the speed comes from not having to take detours. If you consistently move forward over a long enough period of time, you go really far. And so here's a level seven observation for you. 90% of success can be boiled down to consistently doing the obvious thing for an uncommonly long period of time without convincing yourself you're smarter than you are. So I like this quote from Naval Ravikant. It's loose, I just remember from a book or something. Um, I only believe that 1% of decisions matter. The rest of them are irrelevant. The difficulty is understanding which of the 1% of the 99% of the ones that matter. <laughs> and so what I want to give you is some of the frameworks that shape my 1% decision so you can use them too, all right? So first off, this is the premise. Money is a denomination of time. Every transaction we make is for some percentage of our lives. Our wealth is a measure of how little of our lives we must trade for the things that we desire. Money is an IOU from society for future goods and services, which is translated as other people's time for value that we provide. And so to somebody who has lots of money, they need to trade very little time by percentage of their life to get the Lamborghini. For somebody who has no money, they have to trade a very large amount of time to get the same Lamborghini. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a store of time. And so the key multiplier on time is leverage. And the size of the opportunities that we pursue, aka the strategic decisions, are directly proportional to the amount of leverage that we can employ. Rich dads, and I think this is the biggest difference in economic equality, tell their kids to pursue high leverage opportunities, real estate, funds, acquisition, business ownership. That's what they encourage their kids to do because they've already jumped through the levels and they know what is there. Most people don't succeed because of ignorance, not because of lack of desire. Poor dads tell their kids to pursue low leverage opportunities, forcing those kids to have to learn the hard way, like many of us did, what leverage actually is. Many times, never discovering what it is until it's too late. Example, get a good job, build a small business, and I'll clarify what that means in a second, et cetera. And so this is a, a, a good book. You can probably get most of the takings. Um, just total side note, I think one of the most valuable things you can do is just read billionaire uh, autobiographies because you get to see how they think. So he said, uh, and I, this, 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 this hit me like a ton of bricks. He said, it's harder to build a small business than a big business because level 10 talent is only attracted to big opportunities. It's harder because you gotta do it on your own. You gotta do everything. If you chase the big things, it also makes it worth it because small goals and big goals are equally difficult. You have to expend time to achieve either of them. So you might as well make them big. Like really, like that like, does that make sense? Does that like, that hits you? Because that hits me. So with that being established, these are the four frameworks that I use to apply leverage and have given me the quote, faster than normal, quote, material success that many claim to desire. Number one, and I apply these frameworks when we're looking at investing in portfolio companies, when we look at our, ourselves and our own companies, what we're gonna do to, to scale them. And so these are the four things I look at. Number one, scale the entrepreneur. Number two, scale the market. Number three, scale the deliverable. Number four, scale the business. Now, from an equation standpoint, because this is how all these things work together, a level 10 entrepreneur on a level one opportunity will still do pretty well, but not that great. Opportunity is a function of two of these things. The market times the scalability of the deliverable. If you've got a numb nuts on a level 10 opportunity, they'll still make money. Some of you guys know them. <laughs> Some of you guys are them. <laughs> and then finally, the business acumen is to understand how the actual enterprise itself has to scale. All right, so let's start with the first one. 
You are not making as much as you want because you are not as good as you think you are. Fact. If someone in your marketplace, dare I say competitor, is making more than you, it is because they are better than you at the game. Do not throw stones at them, throw stones at your ego instead. Admit deficiencies and learn their strengths. It will be the only way to beat them. So, if we can admit the deficiency, then at least we can create space to learn. So how do we get better? Look at the entrepreneurs, the first and most important thing that we do when we're looking at trying to get into a business. And so every business is bottlenecked by the entrepreneur in one of three ways. And so if you're the entrepreneur, this is you. Number one, you'll either lack a skill. Number two, you will lack a character trait. Number three, you will lack a belief. So imagine a ladder. And you can think of this as you've got traits, you've got beliefs, and you've got skills. If any side of that ladder is missing, no matter how developed the other components, you will be limited to the lowest rung. It's just it's like the, this, is, this is the theory of constraints, right? Just visualized. So, fun activity. I will tell you the problem, and you tell me whether it was a skill deficiency, a trait deficiency, or a belief deficiency. A long time ago in a galaxy far away, I had 10 businesses. I also had no money. I had six gyms. I had a turnaround business, four gyms. I had a chiropractor agency. I had a dental agency. Yeah, I think that's it. So six plus, yeah, right. Nine or 10. A lot, plenty. My lovely wife, Layla, who was not my wife at the time, said, uh, you need to pick something uh, or you're going to, you know, or I'm leaving. And I was like, oh man, that is a high stake. I should pick something. And so, uh, I ended up picking something. <laughs> what do you think the issue was? What was my deficiency as an entrepreneur? Was it a skill? Going to get hands for skill? Hands for trait? Hands for belief? Interesting, okay. Well, this is my opinion. The lesson is niche slapping fallacy, which is the fallacy that if I pursue all of them, one of them will work out, which is a fallacy. It is false, when in reality, all of them could have worked out, but none of them will work out if you pursue them all. And so many of you probably have your hand in two things and you're like, I'm not really sure which one it is. Fucking pick. <laughs> pick. Because the people you're competing against who are beating you just have one thing. And imagine right now for a moment that one of those businesses disappeared. Everything that you have on that business just vanishes. How easy would it be to make the other one win? So just do that. So the lesson was the niche lapping fallacy. What I lacked was focus. And for me, I think focus is a character trait. So that was a trait deficiency. But I wasn't done yet. I still had more things that I was not successful because of. So this is me talking about my grand plans to, this is at my first location, by the way. <coughs> this is how I was showing how I wanted to build America's next gym. And so, sorry, it's really cute. Um, and so anyways, I went to this mastermind. Uh, it was Russell Brunson's Inner Circle. This is five or six years ago. And I said, here are my grand plans. I've got six locations. I'm, I've got my next four picked out. Um, and I told him about how our model works and everything. And he said, I think it's a terrible idea. And like my heart sank. Because I was like, I looked up to this guy so much because I was like, God, I mean, if I can just get one thing from this guy. And he said, Alex, you have a level 10 skill set in a level two opportunity. You shouldn't be running gyms. You should be teaching gyms what you do. And that's where it's like the big frameworks that change your life. And that's what I'm trying to do with this presentation for somebody in the room, is that it's the big strategic decisions that make the big impacts in our lives. It's not the incremental gains. It's the rich dad who says, why are you even bothering with this? This is not big enough. You're never going to achieve scale running a liquor store. It's just not going to happen, right? But you need someone like that from the outside to get that perspective. And so this was what I got from Russell years ago. And so can anyone identify the deficit that I was suffering point at this point in my career? Was it a skill or a belief? Belief. And so this was actually my trajectory of me as a multi-gym owner. I had lots of skills. I had decent character traits, I think. Um, but I didn't know that it was possible. I didn't know that that was something that you could do. And so I switched from being a multi-gym owner to a licensor. 
And so finally, this is what a skill deficiency looks like. And I'll give you one that I hear all the time in internet marketing. I'm sure Ryan has heard this as well. No good salespeople exist. No one can sell like I can sell. My sales team is so inconsistent. Some months they close a lot, some months they close a little. I want to kill them, and sometimes I don't want to kill them. Sound familiar, anyone? This isn't a problem. It is a skill deficiency. You lack the skill of recruiting, hiring, interviewing, training, and managing a high-performance sales team. That's all it is. And so it's not that this does not exist. It's that I do not have the skills to conquer this problem. And so here's a pro tip or a thought, is binaries versus continuums. So if you might check the box and say, well, I know how to manage a sales team. The question is not whether or not you know how to manage a sales team, but how well you can manage a sales team. It's not a binary, it is a continuum. And as a fun thought, all of these things exist on a continuum. Your skills exist on a continuum. Your traits exist on a continuum. It's not whether you're honest or not, it's how honest are you. So the best way to learn is to phrase your bottleneck or complaint into a solvable question. My sales team's inconsistent. How do I learn to create consistency in sales? Simple, right? And skill, I'm not gonna get into how to learn skills, but this is the, the, the quick, quick bit comes from repetition and feedback, AKA volume. The volume of work that you do, which is why I think we need to make active income cool again. All right, so I uh, just looked at my CRM, this is years ago, and I was able to pull uh, the stats from my personal closing, because you have to say who closed something in a CRM for gyms. And over a three and a half year period, I had closed 4,000 sales in the CRM. And these are one-on-one -on -one sales. And so I often get the question, Alex, you seem so certain, or um, you're so good at these things, how do I shortcut that? And the reality is that most people don't have that rocky cutscene of eating shit, and they're not willing to go through it. And maybe you are going through it right now. And so my promise to you is that your work works on you more than you work on it. You build your character through the work that we do. We increase our capacity to do work itself. And so if you can think about the work that you're doing is increasing that trait rather than the output of the work, then I think it will help a lot of people get through some of the harder times. It did for me. And so some of the things, some of the sayings that I have in my community are do the boring work and outwork your self-doubt. Because conviction doesn't come from positive affirmations in the mirror. It comes from having done something so many fucking times that you're bored of it. Because it's like, well, obviously this is how you sell. Obviously this is how you scale a sales team. Because you've done it so many times. And I was on a podcast not that long ago for young male entrepreneurs, and the, the guy was like, hey, you know, I really hear what you're coming from. You know, I know you did your, all those years of eating shit that no one talked about. Um, and so for all the audience that just wants to like shortcut all that, what's your advice? And I was like, you'll never beat me because you're not willing to do it. And so I think that the, the biggest deficiency that people have is their expectations. And so because we have these very lofty expectations, everyone's trying to become a millionaire in 90 days, when if I were to get you a, to sign a contract that says, I promise you'll be a millionaire in five years, but you won't earn anything for five years until you become a millionaire, would you be willing to sign it? Most people say they would, but they don't live like they would. And I promise you that if you live like you would, you'll hit it but everyone just starts over every 90 days thinking that this is going to be the thing when you could have just had that slow gradient that will get you there eventually. So I'd rather get rich for sure than get rich quick. And so the best part about all this stuff is that skills, traits, and beliefs all compound. And that is what yields crazy outsized returns seemingly overnight. And so this is actually one of my favorite parts of the presentation, just a side note. Um, so let me give you an example of someone who's good at math. Let's say you're, anybody here good at math, born good at math? So I wanted to make this into ind individual slides, so pretend each of these lines are not shown until I say them. Cool? Great. All right, so let's say you're good at math, all right? Cool, not very monetizable. All right, moving along. Let's say you're like, you know what? I'm gonna start bookkeeping. I wanna learn how to you know, keep books. Like, okay, cool. Now you have something you can at least monetize. And then you say, you know, I'm gonna get an accounting degree. I'm gonna learn how to do accounting. Okay, now this is something that's really becoming a career. You can feed your family, et cetera. And then you say, you know what, I'm starting to get into tax strategy. And then all of a sudden you learn how you can, you can help businesses avoid tax drag, as my lawyer says. Um, 
And then you learn into you you learn about insurance because you're like, oh, this is cool too, and it has really cool ramifications also for tax, but also for some some investment stuff. Okay, that's cool. And then you learn how to negotiate deal structure. Ah, now we're. Can you start seeing how the person changes as we're talking about adding these skills to the repertoire? First, you're talking about a bookkeeper, then an accountant, then maybe a controller. Now we're talking a CFO. And then you have an amazing mastery of capital markets. Now you're a rainmaker. And so the thing is, is that for this little example, it's one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Uh, equals a zillion, right? The point is that these skills stack on top of each other and create asymmetrical returns to all of these skills that came before it. And as a fun example, this was my actual skill stack. So first I learned how to get in shape and work out. Then I learned about nutrition, which was a whole nother thing. Then I learned how to sell. So I started making a little bit of money. Then I learned how to, oops, market. Locally, so I started getting leads and, and I already knew how to sell so then it was like boom It was like a huge magnifier on the other three skills. I had before that then I learned how to operate So then I scaled to six locations and then I learned how to scale sales teams So I had six people selling at all those locations and then I learned how to market b2b nationally and because I already knew how to scale sales teams I'd been doing it for years. I knew how to do high volume transactions I knew how to operate a big business because I had 40 employees when I was 25 so I had all these other things, but as soon as I had that belief that I had a different vehicle that I could pursue it in, we went from zero to 28 million a year in 20 months. Pretty cool. And so as a different example, here's Jay-Z's little skill stack. He learned how to, uh, <laughs> man, see, if I, if I could have like revealed it later, it would have been funnier, but it's okay. So, he had rhythm, right? He had a natural skill or proclivity, to, proclivity towards rhythm. All right, then he learned how to write lyrics and rhymes, right? Then he learned how to sell, got people his CDs and get on stage, right? Then he learned how to promote himself. Then he learned how to create a label. And then he learned how to recruit other talent. And then he got Beyonce, right? And so the thing is, is, is this making sense? And so. What might be valuable for you, because I think I've just been through an introspective period, is to think, what is my skill stack? And what are my deficiencies? And which of these deficiencies are keeping me from what I want? And why am I not working on them? Cool. So does everyone here see how you can become an entrepreneur through higher leverage, through auditing and improving your skills, traits, and beliefs? Yes? All right, awesome, check the box. So, framework number two, scale the market. So, uh, I went to this mastermind, all the people in this little picture actually do $600 million a year in revenue, uh, which is pretty cool. And I had this really interesting experience because I was one of the smaller guys in the room in terms of revenue. Uh, at the time, I think we were doing 35 or 40 million, somewhere in there. Um, and I was like, why are these guys making more money than me? Because I, like, I was like, I don't think these guys are smarter than me. I was like, why, why are they making more than me? And so I was left with one thing, right? And the answer was, they'd pick better markets. So when I looked at what all of these guys were doing, almost all of them were mass market, they were selling something that was expensive, and they could target the world. And I was like, huh, they have better markets than me. And I was running up into this, this cap of my market, right around 30 or 40 million. And so here's a quick little framework for you guys in terms of how to pick your market, because many times I said that the, the equation here, right? Entrepreneur, level 10, times market, level 10, times delivery vehicle, which I'll get to in a second, level 10, times business acumen is what makes, builds fortunes, all right? So the quick answer was, you have to select the avatar that you can provide the most value to. It's the number one question I get. Which, which avatar should I pursue? The one you can help the most. Simple. The medium answer is pick an avatar so that you can productize your service and provide that value with low operational drag. And that's why you pick one so that you can do the same thing over and over again and get better and better and better at it so you don't have to spend as much resources to do the same level of value, which is create margins, which is what you can take home and spend on Lamborghinis. Cool. So this is my live speech answer. If you had one thing to get with your hot dog stand, so I give everybody here a hot dog stand, and you have one competitive advantage, what would you want? Would you want the best location? 
Would you want the best ingredients? Would you want the best tasting hot dogs? Best marketing? What would you want? Ah, someone's read the book. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is actually a story of a marketing professor who says this at the beginning of every marketing thing, uh, course. He said, what you want is a starving crowd. Because no matter how shitty your location is, if when the football game lets out and everyone's drunk at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you're the only hot dog stand there and you've got a starving crowd coming to you, you're going to sell out your hot dogs. They could be dog shit. You're going to sell them, right? They probably won't even care, right? <laughs> and so these are the four attributes that I look for in a market that I want to pursue. One is pain, right? They must not want but desperately need what I have to sell them. Number two, they must be able to afford what I want to sell them. A friend of mine uh, had a business where he could help people improve resumes to get more jobs. Problem, they didn't got no money, right? Couldn't, couldn't afford his services. The third is tactical, is you want them to be easy to target, right? It's amazing if you want to find you know, vegan grandmas or whatever, but if you can't tactically target them, it's one of those things that I would just cross out and be like, Sounds hard. There's going to be other hard things. I'd rather not add one to my list. And then finally, growing. A good friend of mine um, had, a, had an ad platform that he sold to newspapers. And try as he might, it was growing, and then his growth slowed, and then it started to shrink. And he could not figure out what it was. He was like, I need new hooks. I need new offers. And he couldn't figure out. He's a smart dude. And I was like, hey, Lloyd, I was like, you think it might be because you're selling to newspapers? Shrinking 25% per year, compounding. Right, it's just the big obvious thing. So if you're going to go into business, you might as well do something with the tailwind. If you got the choice, might as well pick something that's growing, right? I know this stuff sounds simple, but some of you guys are in shrinking markets. So I'm like, why? Rich dad, poor dad, right? Just make the smarter decision. So I'm going to skip through this stuff. I hate it, most of it. Um, and uh, I'll, just, I'll say this one little story that I like a lot. Um, Warren Buffett talked about one of his, the smartest classmate and his closest friend from Columbia. And he said, this guy was brilliant, he was hardworking, really high, high character dude. He's like, and I went to go build my partnership, the Berkshire Hathaway, well, eventually would become. Um, and he went into the steel business. And he said, we did dramatically different even though we both had the same skills and level of skill. And he said, and that's what taught me that it was far more important what boat you are in rather than how hard you row. And I think a lot of you guys are in, in rowboats and you need a bigger opportunity vehicle. And so the old VC saying is, great entrepreneur, poor market, market wins. Poor entrepreneur, great market, market wins. That's why when people are looking at investing, they're like, what markets do I want exposure to? Why don't I just ride the tailwind? So. Now once you've selected a better market, you're going to want to scale, right? Right. So um, I'll skip the story, but short, fuck it, short story. Uh, I had an agency owner came up to me and he's like, Alex, I've scaled my agency, everything's saturated, I can't get any more clients, should I enter another market? The guy's doing two million bucks a year, spending $50,000 a month on ads. And I was like, you're right, chiropractors are completely tapped out. The 10 billion a year that goes to chiropractors in total revenue, your rink-a-dink $2 million marketing agency has completely saturated. Whatever shall I do? Great question, friend. These are the five ways you can scale your market. So let's just use salon owners as an example. Let's say that's your, your avatar of who you're going after, whatever. So there's your ideal market. Way number one, you can go up market. All right, so that would be going to multi-location owners, chains, franchises, et cetera. Number two, you can go down market, you go to hairstylists, people who will eventually become your avatar in time. Number three, you can go to an adjacent market, so something that's very similar in terms of the core desires of the customers that you're serving, right? So it might be lashes and nails. You can go broader, which just means going even wider, right? Lashes, nails, skid creeps, med spas, you know, salons, massage, et cetera, right? Or you can go deeper in your existing market, which if I had to tell you, that is usually my favorite, which is buy competitors and go figure out new platforms, add outbound to your system, increase your ad budget. It's just doing more of the thing that you're already doing, which if you ever get anything common themes from me is do the boring work, 
If something's working, do more of it. Usually works better. Great. So does everyone see how you can enter a better market and then scale it? Framework number two? Boom, check. All right, number three. This framework that I'm about to share with you is the opportunity lens through which I look at all opportunities that I want to pursue, all right? It perfectly tracks my progression. This is actually pretty cool. So I got this, I borrowed part of this from Naval Ravikant, um, who's really brilliant. You can follow him on Twitter. Um, but there's four, four C's to leverage, all right? I said the whole premise of this presentation is leverage. So entrepreneur, check that box. Market, check that box. Now scaling the deliverable. So if I'm looking at a company, I want to make the deliverable more scalable, increase the profit margin. Here's how you think about it. So the first level of leverage is labor. So back in the day, this was the only kind of leverage. That's how the pyramids were built. That's how ancient royalty had. They just had bodies, right? The problem with bodies nowadays is that you need permission to do things, right? And so you have to ask people to do things or pay them to do things. Otherwise, they won't do them. It's such a bummer, right? We'd make so much more money if we didn't have to do that. Second, our second level of leverage, and this is a higher level of leverage, is capital. This is what the next generation of billionaires and fortunes were built off of, Buffett, Munger, et cetera. Once again, they used other people's money, so permission is required. Unfortunately, can't just take the money. Um, but you can still make a lot of money just leveraging capital, right? And at this point in time, it was leveraging capital times labor. The third of this is code. The difference here is that this is permissionless. If you write software, you don't need to ask permission to duplicate it. It just will continue to duplicate over and over again, right? At no cost. So if you look at the MailChimp founders, it was code. That is what created their billions. And then finally, you've got content or media, right? That's how Joe Rogan can sell his podcast for $100 million. What's his product? Media. It costs zero cost of replication, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this home in a second. I promise you'll like where we're going, all right? And then you'll notice that above the top line, zero permission is required for either of those things. And that is where the new fortunes are being built. And right now, if you look at that pyramid and you're like, I'm not on that pyramid, you should get on that pyramid because that's where all the fortunes are. And if you look at the very top here, these are guys that use all four. Bezos, Zuck, Dorsey, they've got labor working for them, they've got capital working for them, they've got code working for them, and they have content and media working for them. All of them with permissionless leverage. Interesting? Cool. We call that a leverage four banger. It was funnier on the plane when I added that slide. <laughs> so I was only able to see this trend after I had made these jumps. So my goal is by showing you this trajectory, you can do it proactively, all right? So each opportunity jump that I'm about to show you 10 x my income. So at first I was an employee, I was a management consultant, I was someone else's labor, I was making four figures a month. Then I became a trainer. I was my own labor. I'm my own master, right? So I, I became self-employed. I jumped to five figures a month. Then I became a gym owner. And then I got to finally use labor as leverage. I got to use other people's time, right? And then I went to six figures a month. Then, and this is a big pivot, I went from leveraging labor to leveraging labor and media, which is I started licensing. Right? I started licensing something that has no cost to replicate. All right? And that's when we started making a million dollars a month. I'm talking income, not revenue here, by the way. Next level is eight figures a month. And this is where I think we're headed. We'll do about 85-ish million this year. We'll see how the quarter ends. Um, and this is because now I added capital into this mix. Now I can buy things, right? So that gives me more leverage to expand what I'm already doing. And so this is what I think will get me to eight figures a month. I'll let you know when I get there. Um, and then finally, nine figures a month is doing the whole stack, right? Do I know what I'm gonna do there? Not yet, but I got summers. Okay, so mind you, this is a framework, it's a tool. All models have limits, but it has served me well in thinking how to expand. Is this helping you? Sweet. So you guys want a really cool bonus framework that I've been thinking about for a long time? I have six minutes left, so you won't get it. Okay. <laughs> I can go ahead? All right, fuck it. Well. Pretend you never, uh, is that all right? Okay. So, uh, cool, you said yes to this, fantastic. Okay, so this is low leverage. This actually took me like, you know, these little things take like five minutes each to do little, little lines and shit. Anyways, uh, so, <laughs> so here's framework number three, scaling and deliverable. So this is the delivery cube. So when I look at a business that I'm looking to buy into or improve, et cetera, 
These are six different types of questions that I ask, which is number one, can I do this thing in a one-on-one -on -one setting, a small group setting, or a one-to-many setting? And can I change the price accordingly? Number two, is this a do-it-yourself, a done-with-you, or a done-for-you solution? Can I move along that spectrum in either direction in a way that might optimize my outcome for better profits? Number three, what level of support do I want to offer? This is a little bit more service-based, but hopefully it'll help some of you. Um, do I want to do text support? Do I want to do chat support? Do I want to do email support? Do I want to do phone support? Do I want to do Zoom call support? What type of support do I want to provide? Do I want to provide different levels at different income levels or different payment levels? Something to consider. Consumption. For if I'm licensing material, do I want it to be written? Do I want it to be live like this? Do I want it to be audio only? Do I want it to be video? How am I going to package the information? Number five, speed and convenience. If someone has help from me, is it 24 7? Is it 9 to 5? Do they have a response time of under a minute? Do they have a response time of two days? Right? These are all variables that you can use to increase or decrease the value or margin that you're using to deliver. And then finally, this is probably my favorite of the six boxes, if you can have a favorite on a framework about delivery. Um, <laughs> one is, I want you to imagine the value that you provide right now and the price you charge for it, okay? Now, I want you to 10x that price. Now, I want you to think about what you would deliver if that were actually your price. How much more would you do? Interesting thought process. Blue sky, do it on your own time, but it's a good thought experiment you should do it with your team. Number two, think again about your, your, your current product. If you had to deliver more value than you currently are, but for one-tenth the price, what else would you need to build? that would cost nothing to replicate, to provide the value. And number three, if I, if I could have a, la a favorite question of my last framework of number box six, this would be it. If right now, the gods of marketing, Ryan Dice gives the God voice and says, you can no longer get new customers from marketing, and the only thing you have are your existing customers, and the only way to get a new customer is for those customers to bring them to you. How different would your client experience look? Food to think on. The thing is, if people think that word of mouth is dead, that book right now, if you just do the math, is selling like $250,000 a month of books off of word of mouth and no funnels. People can spread stuff faster than ever before. We're just not taking advantage of it because we're too greedy and too short-term thinking. Like if people aren't referring your stuff, fix the stuff. Why bother promoting it? People don't want to talk about it. I don't know. Time check for myself. Apparently I'm on time. Um, <laughs> everything is for sale. And this is, a, this is another quick framework I'll give you for scaling delivery. I have a ton of these. These are just two that I wanted to bring up. So these are the only things you can ever sell, because I've been trying to think through what are the base chunks, base units of shit you sell, all right? You got products, you got services, you got access, you have media, you have risk, and you have money. Only things you can sell. And I challenge you to think of something else, and if you do figure one out that doesn't include these as base chunks, I'll add it, all right? Because I've been thinking a lot about this. And what's even cooler about this is that each of these components have physical and digital pieces. So a physical product would be a bag of you know, dog bones, right? A digital product is what a lot of you guys sell, like a course, right? A physical service would be like a massage. A digital service might be marketing. Physical access would be access to this event or to a real estate building that you rent every day so that you can have shelter. Uh, digital access might be if there was a virtual recording of this live, digital access. You have physical media like a billboard, digital media, you guys should hopefully know what that is, you're here. You've got physical risk like your building is being insured and then you've got digital risk like a cyber attack. And then you've got physical money and everybody knows about cryptocurrency. This is kind of cool, the different things you can sell. So here's the challenge is can you think through how you can add one of these other components to your existing offer stack without providing a lot of operational drag but while also providing value? All right, and so I got a couple, I presented this to a couple, a smaller group, um, and they were like, what about experiences? And I was like, experiences are products plus service plus access. 
A business is all of those things chunked together. Titles, like if I, if I wanted to make you a knight, right, what do you get? You get access. If I wanted to give you IP, that is access to products. So when you're thinking through this, like those are the base chunks that build everything. And so I think sometimes when we can just boil it down to what are the base units, it can be useful in thinking, what else can I sell? Or what can I transform my existing things into that are more valuable? And so here's an easy thought. This is one of the more genius things that we did, is that if you're an ad, anybody here an ad agency? Couple people. Well, I'll tell you what we did, is that we, uh, we had the agency side, and they were like, huh, what if we just find the winners and then license the winners every single month to everybody else who wants to run their own ads? All margin. Great idea. Made us an extra million a month in profit. You should try it. Good, Reco recommend. Um, number two, add an experience to continuity, right? Or add physical products to digital experiences, right? These are all different ways you can mix and match these things. Time check return, fantastic. Does everyone see how you can add leverage to your deliverable from those two frameworks I shared? Yes? Say yes? Awesome, all right. Check the box. Number four, scale the business. So we covered a lot today, and we feel like this a little bit? All right, fantastic. So I'll wrap this up by showing you what we can focus on at each revenue level, in, that we, what we focus on at each revenue level for our portfolio businesses when we come in to scale them, all right? So these are my last five years of revenue um, from 2017 till now, all right? If you notice, that's what being stuck looks like. I didn't know what to do. And so um, anybody want to know what happened there? Yes? Cool. I read this book, um, which I recommend. It's a good book. Uh, but there was one chapter in it that completely uh, made everything click for me. And so I applied that book um, because up to that point, I intimately understood what it took to get to you know, 35, 40-ish million, but I didn't know how to get past it. Now I do, and that's what I'm going to share with you. All right? So who here is zero to a million? Can we leave egos at the door? OK, cool. One product, one avatar, one channel. If you have multiple businesses and you're under seven figures a year, stop. More businesses clearly aren't making you more money. One product, one avatar, one channel. But I thought I should have multiple acquisition channels. You don't even fucking make money yet. So no, one product, one av avatar, one channel. The problem that you're trying to solve here is that you have no fucking clue what you're doing. All right, the objective is consistently sell something to people who actually want. That's the objective. That is why we talked about picking the right market first. One to 10 million. The objective is to increase the lifetime gross profit per customer. I don't like saying lifetime value because no one knows what it means and it's uh, revenue for the most part. I like to think about what is my gross margin on the things that I'm selling, right? The problem is that most times when you're at that million-ish, you're not making enough money, take home. And so the problem is that you're not making enough profit per customer to scale, which is what is required to go from one, to one million to 10 million. And so the objective is to add higher leverage deliverables so that you can make more money. Hence why we went over the deliverables. Make sense? Awesome. 10 to 50 million. What happens here is that your consistency of delivery starts to drop, and so what you need to do is you actually have to start professionalizing the business. This is where you actually pay taxes and you know, don't go to jail and pay payroll and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and the problem is that you have inconsistent delivery, you have poor tracking, your CRM issues are fucked, and your finances are a mess, all right? The solution is you have to hire a high-level experience who've already done this before, all right? So that is where framework number four is. This is scaling the business. This is actual business acumen, all right? And then finally, framework X, uh, and framework one is alive this entire time because you have to become the entrepreneur that is required at each level. Sometimes your best is not good enough because what is required is more than your current best. And so I think rather than thinking like, I'm trying my best, it's like, well, it's clearly not working. So why don't we just try fixing the problem and ignoring your feelings? So. Framework X, attract talent, all right? And this was the piece that I was missing, is that what happens is you have to grow revenue streams. Innovation dies at this level of business because one entrepreneur can only do so much, right? And so you need other stallions to come in who can drive revenue, all right? And so at this point, the business actually becomes a conglomeration of many businesses. So think about it of having 10 CEOs that all run their own P&Ls that are actually growing their own mini businesses within the larger context of yours. If you think about Amazon, Amazon isn't one business, it's a zillion businesses globbed together. So as you scale, it becomes more globbing things together, becomes more acquisition, et cetera. Um, 
as a result of this, all right? So here's the solution is you have to get new talent incentivized to drive growth. So I'm gonna skip this story. You guys wanna hear a cool mental model? Alex Sharfin's right here. So there's six external, this is the functions how I define them. I know you have five, I'm just, you know. So one is lead gen, two, lead nurture, three, sales, four, customer success, five, ascension, six, resell, all right? These are the things that all of you probably know how to do, hopefully, right? This is how you scale. These are the six internal business functions that mirror the external. Everybody knows their CPCs, their CPMs, what percentage click-through rate, their speed to response, hopefully, uh, what percentage close rate you guys have. But I'll bet you if I asked you how many applications do you get a month, what percentage of those applications do you get to book a call, what percentage of interviews are you, are you transitioning into a full-time role, what does your onboarding look like for a new employee, what does that training look like, how do we ascend those people, what is their career path, is it clearly defined for them with role, title, and pay? And then finally, what's our retention on this? And I'll tell you the quick story for why this is important. So I had a team of, uh, right now we have a, a big cold call team, we have about 26 guys, and the lowest rung on that is cold calling. So they call people who don't know, and so for those of you who are like, our sales team sucks, it's like try calling people who don't even know who you are and then get them to buy a $40,000 thing. So our sales team's pretty good. So, we had this goal for two quarters. My sales director said, we're gonna, we're gonna add another 10 BDRs. And I said, great goal. Two quarters later, we haven't added 10 BDRs. So third quarter in a row, I was like, what's your goal? He's like, I'm gonna add 10 BDRs. And I was like, I feel like we've done this before. So why haven't you added the 10 BDRs? And uh, because this is where we're like, okay, this many calls equals this much sales, blah, 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 right? Everyone's done this. What do you think the bottleneck was? And I was like, wait a second, how many people are you interviewing a week? Five, from HR. And I was like, well, five's not gonna get us there. Because that was just replacing the churn of the frontline position. And just like you have churning customers, you have churning employees, especially at the front line. And so when we discovered that the actual limiting factor was HR, not running enough ads to get enough interviews, and changing the actual process, we had 10 hired in two weeks, and it took us three quarters to get there. And so, two weeks later, now we have double the applications that are coming in for our business. And I'll bet you that all of you have one of these things, you're one amazing hire away from all the growth you ever wanted. You just gotta identify it that that's actually probably most of your bottleneck, especially as you scale. Cool. So, does everyone have a clear idea what they need to focus on to scale their business at their current level? Yes? Checkbox number four. Awesome. So, did everyone get something they can take away, hopefully, and drag their future by the balls towards the present? If you enjoyed this stuff, you can get more frameworks like this for free at acquisition.com. That's a course, there's no opt-in. You can just watch it, it has downloads and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's free, there you go. And if you like this, my book's 99 cents. I have a YouTube thing that's free. I have a Gram thing that's free, obviously. And uh, if you're a company that's e-learning or brick and mortar chain looking to scale, we help companies that go from here to here and beyond. And at acquisition.com, we believe you should only have to get rich once. Thank you. <laughs>